Public attention has again been focused on the issue of disability following the tragic death of Marlon King recently. My guest on profile today, Anisia Gail Geddes, has spent a number of years studying the issues of disability. Welcome to Profile. I'm Ian Boyne. Disability and Inequality is the recently published book by my guest, Anisia Gail Geddes. It details the discrimination and prejudice that disabled people face in Jamaica in particular. It is a wealth of information showing what happens both in Jamaica and in the world. The recent death of Marlon King has again focused attention on the plight, the disadvantage that uh, persons with disability face in countries like Jamaica, where social investment in the marginalized is not where it ought to be. Uh, Anisio has spent a lot of time looking at these issues, has done a lot of field research, and she shares that with us today. We thank you for your company on Profile. And it's uh, good to have your very fine book, Empirically Rich, just um, published this press. year. Hot just off hot off the um, uh, press. Uh, really fine work. It came out of your PhD thesis. It did. Your interest in persons with disabilities started when you were at Queen's. Yes, it started. T tell us about yes. um, the introduction to, yes. th to those issues. Well, Ian, thank you for having me, and I'm happy that you think that the book is so rich. It is. Right. It is. Uh, my uh, introduction to disability began whilst in high school at the Queen's School. Uh, a friend of mine and I were attending Sixth Form Association meeting, and we met a young man at the time, a student of Calabar High School, Damien McLean, and he was very articulate and energetic, and we had a lot of verbal spark and mm -hmm. my friend and I, Tamara, decided to take him on after the meeting ended and we went to take him on and we discussed and um, I had robust discussion about whatever topic it was. I don't remember what it was, but it was rich. And when he walked off, when we were finished the discussion and yeah. so on, he walked off, realized he was using a cane. I didn't even know what a cane was at that time. But I later again mm -hmm. met him at the University of the West Indies when my friend and I were walking. Yes. And he identified us a year later by our very voices. Uh -huh. And that is what, that is, is at that time I asked him, what are you doing with this, you know? And I mm -hmm. learned a lot more about persons with disabilities. So that was my introduction to persons with disabilities, which now segued into my university experience. Ian, I also met Floyd Morris, while a resident of yes. Taylor Hall. Uh, he was a tutor in the department where I was a student. Mm -hmm. And um, I assisted him as he graded assignments. And so those two individuals provided a foundation and my baptism, if you will, yes. into the subject of disability studies. And when I went on to graduate studies uh, as a student doing a PhD in social policy, you are encouraged to do groundbreaking work, uh, to make an uh. impact on society. And I, through my experiences, recognize the, what I at that time called unfairness of society towards my friends and decided to dig deeper. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. is where it began, yeah. What were some of the things that your research on earth, because you, you went to a number of areas in Jamaica. Yes. You met with the persons Person. with disabilities yes. themselves. You went into their homes. You, you went into their, their social environment. What were some of the, the crucial things that came out to you that, that hit you and really made an impact on you? Yes. Well, Ian, beyond the persons with disabilities themselves, I interfaced with the caregivers of persons with disabilities because they provide rich information, sometimes even before the person, the child who is born with a disability is aware of what a disability is. The parent or caregiver or guardians would have been exposed to what I call courtesy stigma, where because the child is disabled, they are excluded from 
from access to education, from mm. a playground in the community, and that kind of a thing. So the book richly posits a number of information, such mm -hmm. as one, that persons with disabilities are five times unlikely to access any form of education or training. Five times? Five times uh, likely. Uh, They're uh, twice uh, as likely to be without any formal educational certification, mm -hmm. and they are more likely to earn below the minimum wage. Yes. So that is why the title of the book is Disability and Inequality, Absolutely. because at what first seemed to me as unfairness, I have now used empirical data to support a case for inequal conditions in Jamaica, mm -hmm. looking now at the socio-cultural environment, because attitudes, Ian, though intangible, form a Excuse critical me. platform which people use in their minds to exclude people from participation in all aspects of life, whether it's politics, mm -hmm. whether it's work, mm -hmm. whether it's education, whether it's social life, whether it's a relationship with a partner, it becomes now a barrier. And, and many feel that people with disabilities are less than human. They are, they are less than full absolutely, human absolutely, beings. Absolutely, Ian. And it's a, it's a critical point that you've, you've highlighted because I remember vividly being in a focus group discussion and that a lady said to me, you know what I want people to know most of all is that we are human beings yes. too. And I am strengthened by that kind of uh, 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 feedback because then another person said to me, Ian, that, you know, I think the work that you're doing is important and this is really what stimulated me to produce this book. Yeah, because right. for many, your doctoral dissertation remained in a university library yes, somewhere, yes. but I felt very um, committed to give voice to the lived experiences of persons with mm -hmm. disabilities. So throughout that, re that, that uh, entire research experience, I became, as it were, a tool and accessory yes. for advocacy on behalf behalf of persons with disabilities. And there are regional differences. For, for, for example, in the rural areas, uh, persons with disabilities experience even more Absolutely. discrimination. Absolutely, even more because discrimination. There, there's a lot of superstition involved. I mean, we in Kingston are superstitious also. Yes. But there's still a strong belief in the rural areas, particularly yes. Yes. that people with disabilities are demon-possessed mm -hmm. and they had some sins, some sins the of the appearance that their parents yes. committed and something wrong with them. Absolutely. So people actually keep away from them. Absolutely. And, and you were saying even those who go in business, people yes. don't want to buy anything people from them. People don't want to buy from them. I, I, they might I, catch something. Absolutely. I can share two experiences where some IT training program was being provided and um, a young man said, listen, I'm not going to an IT training program. No person going to carry them computer for a disabled man fix. You see? <laughs> yes. And another, I remember a family they, which consists, they have three daughters with disabilities and the mother of the three daughters also has a disability and they tried um, poultry re rearing at yeah, home yes. and they said nobody would nobody buy going from buy the nobody chicken. going buy from them. So the whole matter of stigma and discrimination, yes. though it's not palpable, mm -hmm. it's a real experience that persons with disabilities have and to And unfortunately, with. religion... Reinforces this. Yeah? It, it reinforces, religion reinforces it yes, in some people. ways, but religion also empowers right. persons with disabilities. So people don't remember both when God said to Moses when he stuttered that I'm the one who made the death, you okay. know, and that, you know, I'll help ask Aaron to assist you. Mm. So people never really grasp onto the fact that Jesus was always lifting up people, and so should we too. Oh. So mm. even though the Judeo Christian ethic mm. is in part responsible for some of these um, attitudes and values and cultural practices towards persons with disabilities that you're going to rid them of evil and demon, then that same Judeo-Christian ethic the sources also of liberation. sources of liberation and empowerment for many. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, there was an interesting quote here I had from, um, from your, your work. I think it was mm -hmm. in page 44. Yes. Um, where you quoted someone saying, if you go to the country, you will realize that you will never see a disabled person on the street going about their normal business like in the Kingston area. Because in the country, they put their children locked away. Yes. Even if they're a big person, adult, and can do everything for themselves, they lock them away. Yes. Because they're ashamed. They're shame. embarrassed. Shame. So it's called courtesy stigma. Where courtesy stigma. Courtesy stigma. So the, the disability, the, the stigma uh -huh. that is assigned to the disability now becomes transferred to the friends, the family. So they fear for public association <laughs> because they now feel as if they're going to be now warped or surrounded by yes. the air of disability, which is not on the mainstream of society. So nobody wants to be associated with anything that is 
is negative. So the hegemonic, mm -hmm. the, the broad brush um, understanding of disability is one that is negative in Jamaica, even though things have been changing, particularly through the advocacy of persons with disability since the 1970s. But Ian, I said to you, the more things change, the more things remain the same. And these these negative connotations and associations with disabilities mm -hmm. even more strong in the rural and you areas. Played a significant role in advocacy for the recent change in legislation. Absolutely. You were on a, the, I, the, I the served committee. on the Disability Advisory Board, the oh, National Disability Advisory Board that uh -huh. advises the government on policy issues for yes. about two or three years. Mm -hmm. And I also in two thousand four was a chairperson for the consultation committee that for the, the development of the National Disability Act. Good. Yes. And you see a new Marlon King uh, personally. Uh, he was tragically um, killed by a JUTC bus on Golden Avenue some weeks ago. She will give us some insights into uh, Marlon's life. She has worked with a number of persons with disability and has produced this book just off the press January this year, Disability and Inequalities. Our honor to have her on profile. We'll take a break, but we'll be right back. Welcome back to Profile. My guest, Dr. Anisia Gail Yedis, is the author of this book, Disability and Inequality, Socioeconomic Imperatives and Public Policy in Jamaica. Uh, she played an important role in the advocacy for the recent change in legislation to do with uh, persons with disabilities. She has done a lot of work. A PhD thesis was done in the area of um, disability studies. And this book came out of that work. She really feels passionately about ending discrimination and stigmatization of persons with uh, disability and is intent on adding her voice to that uh, struggle. To quote again from, from the work, which is you know, a really fine work, a lot of first person accounts in this book. Here, here's another. Some of them, the parents treat um, them, persons with disabilities, like baby. People come and say, I, I wonder if the clothes were washed clean and peep on me in my kitchen cooking. They cracked the window. People peeped in a blind man's house to see if and how he and his wife had sexual intercourse at night. Yes. So they, they go through all kinds yes. of, <coughs> of, 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 of things. Yes. Um, how do they cope, yes. Anisio, yes. dealing with their, with their physical and mental disabilities and also the psychological assault? Yes. How do they cope? Yes. What it, helps it, it, them to cope? <laughs> they deal with that incursion by uh, not two main coping strategies, yes. really. One, there is some level of reliance on on the will to exist, which is a human oh, condition. Yes. Survival Diver is natural to human oh, beings. So key, and yeah. so they realize that, I remember a, a lady saying, you know, if me have to survive, me have to fight, you know? Oh, so there's a, nice there's a fighter spirit I that see. either can be broken yes. by the situation or the situation can propel the individual to use that experience of hardship to want better, oh. to work that much harder and longer to realize benefits that I'm proving through this work are unequal. And so that is the main coping strategy, using that that drive, that, that, drive that hardship now as a drive to survive, yes. But they know things are stacked against them. Can you imagine the, the regular poor person yes. who is able-bodied yes. and who is not faced with this particular challenge yes. of disability? Just regular poverty is so hard. Yes, is so, it's so challenging. Any trouble it would seem. Yes, can you imagine that is coupled now? Yes, 
right. with, with disability. With disability. So it becomes more, more challenging. And in fact... But you find people cope. Cope, uh, absolutely. Find cope, cope and exist. And exist. Right? Because of that, that internal drive yes. that is insatiable, that leads them towards achieving yes. more than, because they're very aware that they have to achieve more it's than fancy. to compete with the person who is called non-disabled or yes. temporarily able-bodied person. <laughs> but the, the, second, second um, the second thing, Ian, is that there is you, for those who are successful and are able to overcome the challenges, there's always the identification of, a, of one person, whether it's through church or through family, who always encouraged. Yes, there are those who've had no one to encourage them, yes. but most of those who've been able to achieve excellence would have had Somebody. someone who so at some point in time said, listen, you know, you can do it, you know, yeah. just try this much harder. So, so that is really how Social support cope. encouragement. Social so support is very critical. important for us, for those of us who know people yes. with physical challenges it, and, and mental, mental challenges. Yes. It is important that we encourage them. We encourage them, not only encourage them, but facilitate, facilitate, create an environment that is accessible for them. So if you own a business, yeah. then ensure that the business is accessible. I remember talking to a man. He uses a wheelchair in a, in a rural parish. And he says, listen, I gave somebody some money to buy something for me on the inside. And he the person disappear. disappeared. So they are yes, naturally vulnerable because of the barriers that they experience mm -hmm. in society. They are yeah. not able to access goods and services as a regular person. Mm -hmm. And so this causes an incursion, if you will, yes. on their whole existence and sometimes will leave, lead to lifetime dependence mm -hmm. yeah. and emaciation of self-concept. Tell us about Marlon King. You knew him personally. Yes. He has been to your home. Yes. Tell me how you met him, your association with yes. him. What kind of person was he? I met Marlon King um, in 2004 when the Combined Disabilities Association was having a meeting by Salvation Army School. Mm -hmm. And I was assisting at that meeting. And after... Of course, I was there because of the research, and mm -hmm. I was introduced um, by Monica Bartley at the time, I believe it was. And he took me on at the end of the meeting and said, you know, <laughs> holy poor people come out here and do research, you know. <laughs> what is your agenda? Yes. And, of course, he really questioned why the research was being done oh. and wanted to ensure that this research was going to be action research and mm -hmm. was going to be sitting on someone's shelf. Mm -hmm. And so it really motivated me to get the product out. But Marlon, on a personal level, a hardworking, industrious person. Yes, he was a jewelry maker. Oh. And um, he was on the, the Innovators, Innovators program, program recently, yes. you know, showing how he really wanted to expand his business and benefit from mm -hmm. ideas. So he's always a person who is full of industry, always searching for ways to improve his craft. He was not dependent. He was not dependent and he started off. I remember he told me, boy, you know, and this year, I passed my common entrance for Calabar, you know. He passed? Yes, he passed his, his common entrance for um, Calabar. It wasn't GSAT yet. Mm -hmm. um, and Calabar was physically inaccessible and he attended Mona High School because mm -hmm. he had acquired his disability as a child through gunshot, uh, a gunshot, gunshot wound. wound. And so, you know, just, just from his educational experiences and growing up, it mm -hmm. was difficult for him because of the barriers which he experienced. But he was resourceful. But he was resourceful and he was naturally resilient. He really had a strong work ethic, which is why I guess as Jamaicans would say, me and him take tea so well mm -hmm. because I realized that this was somebody that really had, you know, got to So to his death through. really hit you. When you heard, how oh, you felt when you heard that Marlon was, was killed? Boy, and I was hit. It's like... It affected you. It affected me tremendously because for all the time, all along, we knew that the area is um, inaccessible. You so know, you knew you, you had raised issues have been raised issues, about that place. These issues have been raised a long time. Long because, time. Because right on that Golden, Golden Avenue, Avenue, you have a school that caters for students with disabilities, mm -hmm. right? A school mm -hmm. of hope. There's also the Sir John Golden Rehabilitation yes. Center, which is the primary um, facility of its kind in the yes. entire English-speaking Caribbean. Yes. There's the University Hospital, and further down, right. the Leonard the Leonard Cheshire Village, where a lot of it's an independent living facility li yes. where a lot of persons with disabilities live. So it's, it's an it's accident waiting to happen. It was an accident. 
not an accident waiting it's to happen. Accident. It's still an accident. It's true. Tomorrow it could happen again. Mm -hmm. And so we have to change structurally how we accommodate persons with disabilities. It's not a charity thing, Ian. It's not one that you're asking for emotion. It's a real circumstance. Yeah. Persons with disabilities have children like everybody yes. else. Yes. And so when they are gone, it affects their children. Absolutely. And so I really, it's my hope that the loss of Marlon's life will yeah. spur yeah. action and there will be someone, some agency that is accountable for the results. Yes. A passionate speaking, Anisia Gail Geddes. She has spent a lot of years looking at these issues affecting persons with disability and she's making a call to action. She'll tell us about her own life and her own challenges when we come back from a final break on Profile. Dr. Anisia Gail Geddes is program manager with responsibility for poverty reduction at the PIOJ. You have had your own challenges. Yes. You are the daughter of a teenage mother. Your mother was 16 yes. when she had you, which yes. means that she was pregnant oh. when she was 15. Yes, yes. Lots of challenges there, right? Eh? Yes, yes. You, did you grow up with her? Your grandmother right yes. after? Yes. Tell us well, about yes. those challenges. Well, yes, Ian, I've had my own challenges, and I think it contributes to who I am today. Um, I, my mother had me when she was 16 years old. Mm -hmm. um, she was attending school at the time, and my father was an adult. That was a big he, man. He, right, was a yes. big man. He, I, in fact, I have a brother that is about um, six months older than I am. Um, so it, I became a ninth child for my grandparents mm -hmm. because they have eight children. Where were they? Where at the time, we were residing in Bull Bay. Bull Bay and so we have early experiences of dealing with political upheaval violence. and yeah. violence uh, my grandmother was telling me the story and my aunt recently of you know at the time it being so violent they had to hide me in a chicken coop mm -hmm. and they were so surprised that I remained silent <laughs> while the people were going through the community mm -hmm. because there had been a, an instance where a child was 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 almost hurt and they really wanted to protect me mm -hmm. so I started off on on footing that wasn't um, so so stable but thankfully I had uh, my grandparents who took me under their, their wings in yeah. fact I called my father daddy all these years I didn't know that he wasn't even my father I, never, I didn't think it's strange that my my grandmother's husband was my father and I also had a mother that I had two mothers because well, you called your me, grandfather your I called my grandfather daddy. daddy I called my grandmother grandmom and my mother mommy so you didn't know your, your father at, the time. at that time I didn't know my father I recall meeting him for the first time when I was about 12 years old the first time you met him yes when I was 12 years old in, in primary school was he supporting you before he wasn't supporting wasn't before supporting he before. was an absentee, absentee um, father, father. Um, but when I met him I met my brothers and sisters who were very close today mm -hmm. and my stepmother yes um, mm -hmm. my stepmother um, she is really a tower of strength oh. so she I call her my stepmother mother who fathered me I right see. in those later years so you know a hard work but you grew woman. up in several several places several like, places including several inner city areas several inner city areas as well as water rural areas and... waterhouse um, when my grandmother and her husband and my uncles and aunts migrated in in 1986 when I was about six years old oh. I it caused a lot of shifting of environments so at one point I lived in Westmoreland in in Savla Mart another point I lived in waterhouse for two years mm -hmm. with my father I also oh. lived um, in the Golden Spring area with my mother oh, who oh. did odds and ends jobs like host keeping security work oh. going to cure so buying and selling so you know it was really a time that was difficult because by the time my mother was 28 um, which is when she when I had my first child mm -hmm. um, she already had four children That's so four we're looking at reversing a yes. cycle of intergenerational transfer of poverty and you were the first person would have gone to university from absolutely family. from my family that would have gone to university mm -hmm. and, and gotten a degree so I really didn't grow up with role models except save and except that I saw within my grandmother and my mother that strong work ethic and even my stepmother you know she worked at, at the market and she sold and that kind of a thing and you know in working at the market she had a stall and a veranda I and so see. 
you know, I ethic. saw that that hardworking um, ethic that really influenced me. And you followed me. that? You, you, you worked during school? I, absolutely. I, I followed that hardworking ethic. And throughout, uh, when I was in high school, fifth form, sixth form, yeah. I worked during the Christmas period while mm -hmm. going to the university. As soon as I set foot in, because I knew I was a beneficiary of student loan. Yes. And my student loan grant wasn't coming till the second semester. So I had to work so because work. I didn't have any benefactor yes. to provide resources. Mm -hmm. While I, my grandparents migrated, I was able to depend on tuition in high school, but their income couldn't support tuition <laughs> fees at the tertiary level. Yes. So then I had to work to assist myself in terms of um, accessing So you benefits. worked and studied throughout I worked university. and studied well, even while I was doing my PhD. PhD. Yes, you, you I did. Um, I was a research assistant at, at, at the university as well. So, you know, it was always working because, you see, I, I grew up seeing that juggler working ethic because you can't just roll over and play dead air. Yeah. You have to work hard. And fortunately for me, my grandmother instilled in me the love for learning. You know, she would teach mm -hmm. me like the books of the Bible and, so you, you know, Bible stories. So I have an insatiable desire for learning and reading, which also transmit now, transmits now to my daughter. So mm -hmm. um, that caused me to read until people say lights out. And when they say lights out, you light a candle or light a lamp. You used to read under the lamp? Right, read under the lamp. I have a, a, a family member who makes fun of me that, now I'm wearing contacts here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They say that you can't see because you're reading too much lamp or too much um, candle. But, you know, but you, you know, driven. we driven. You wanted to succeed. Wanted to succeed. As, you know, we say in Jamaica, if you want good, you know, have a run. Mm -hmm. And you have to at, come to a point where you realize what is your social circumstance. Yes. And mm -hmm. whether you are satisfied with that circumstance. Yes. Unfortunately for me, I learned that there were two Jamaicas whilst I was in high school and I knew the Jamaica that I wanted to be a part of one that it was more secure hard-working and being able to reap the benefits of development and contribute as uh, as a make a contribution a meaningful mm -hmm. and resourceful contribution to development myself and not just a beneficiary yes. of the development process but really a contributor and even at the university in student government we I was uh, a guild president, president president of the guild one of the few females when I was president I was probably the first female in about 20 years, oh. um, president of the Guild of Students. So throughout my life, Your social advocacy, advocacy has, was, has was continued. Yes. And now this important um, book, this important academic work, Disability and Inequality, uh, just published this year, really a gold mine of information. Anisio Gail Geddes, uh, living a really purpose-driven life. Next week, I'll be back. Until then, Ian Bourne wishing you a very pleasant and a very productive week.